As I finished the interview, the interviewer stood up and said, give me a few minutes, and then walked away and went to the back as I sat seated at the table of the job I was interviewing for. The job was a server in Louisville, Kentucky at the restaurant P.F. Chang's. They were hiring. I had experience. I could put a couple of sentences together coherently and I could smile, so therefore it should be a no-brainer situation. And as I sat there and servers came by and said, hey, are you okay? Do you want us to get you a soda? Uh, Everything good? I just said, no, I'm fine. And I just sat there and it was at that moment where it's been a little bit too long and it started to get a little bit awkward as how long I was sitting there. Because again, slam dunk, it shouldn't be a problem. The interviewer finally came back and said, sorry about the wait. Uh, I have a few more questions for you. And I said, okay. He said, are you sure you want to work here? Because I'm not really inclined to give you a job here. And I said, well, why not? And he said, you don't know, you may not know this. Maybe you do because you have experience, but servers are some of the biggest scoundrels to ever walk the face of the earth. Drugs, sex, rock and roll, and everything in between. And you said you're here to go to seminary school. And I don't want this environment to mess you up. I had two thoughts. First, what kind of Christians did they have as servers here? Second, is that what the world thinks of Christians in the workforce? That those get so swept away by the treasures of life that we cannot be called into dark areas? I didn't know that those questions had answers, so I had to give this interview a clever answer. And I said, well, sir, the way I see it is simply this. I've been saved out of darkness by the glorious riches, the divine election of God to be a light in the darkest of places. So the way I figure it, the darker, the better. He said, sounds good to me. See on, see on Monday, you start Monday. Hey, man, did God use that restaurant to pay my way through school? Got to see people come to know the Lord. Prayed with people who lost family members. And I thought, church, where we work and how we work matters. You hear this really weird statistic all the time. 70% of our country is Christians. And we all know that's just a crock and a lie. Because the question is, is are they truly Christians or do they just self-identify as Christians? Too many people have sat under preaching where the pastor would say, pray this prayer, let's dunk you in the water, you're in the club. Rather than asking the question, has your life changed? Do you truly love God? Do you truly love his word? Do you truly want to see his kingdom be glorified more than your own kingdom? Are you all about giving of yourself for the glory of God, picking up your cross and following him? Remember the great words of the Westminster Shorter Catechism of Faith. The chief end of man is to what? Glorify God and enjoy him forever. You see, the problem is that so many people see their job as a place just to collect a paycheck, just to punch the clock, just to get through life. But beloved, as Christians, if we have been saved by the blood of the Lamb, we have been saved not of a perishable seed, but of an imperishable seed, the living, enduring, abiding Word of God. And so do you and I see our salvation as that. If you have the Spirit of God indwelling in you, do you recognize that you are an instrument in the hands of God for His glory? And this is the question Paul seeks to answer. So if you have your Bibles, go ahead and grab them. We're going to be in Colossians 3. We're going to get finally finish up Colossians chapter 3 this week as we have seen Paul walk through the application of the gospel. As we've seen Paul walk through how the preeminency of Christ affects every single part of your life and my life. That there is not a part in our life that Christ doesn't claim as his if we have been saved by the blood of the Lamb. And so as you are 
are turning to Colossians 3, this glorious, beautiful, amazing letter started with that truth that Christ is preeminent, supreme over all things, and in his supremacy we bow down. I love that the man who was the prolific writer of the New Testament, the Apostle Paul himself, never got tired of the gospel message. He got tired of people saying, the gospel is great, but what about dot, dot, dot? That wore him out. But Jesus Christ and him crucified was his marching orders from the moment God knocked him off the donkey until the moment his head was chopped off in Rome. He said, Christ crucified and resurrected. That is my life. And so there is no room. There is no time for the gospel is great, but it is the gospel and the gospel of alone, alone, the outpouring of God's love, the spirit and dwelling within all who believe and Empowered to glorify God to the furthest reaches of the world. And so we're going to see this morning and start to think about how we as Christians think about work and our jobs and our careers that we've been called to. And so I, I know there's some of you in here that, you know, you might be in a part-time job. And it's not ultimately what you want to do for the rest of your life. And beloved, I'm here to tell you, you won't be there forever. But the good news is, yeah, amen, Steph, I'm with you. But the good news is, is God will use those little moments to prepare you for the great moments. And he's done so. And beloved, we have a great calling on our lives. And so I want us to see this. But before we do, let us pray and seek the Lord's help this morning. Would you pray with me? Father God, we thank you. God, that you chose us in him before the foundations of the world to be holy and spotless before you. God, we thank you that we as a church are here for the glory and the majesty of you. And so our Father, we come before you and we ask for help in this time. God, speak to us. Open up your word to us. Lift the book to our hearts. Now, church, I just pray for me. Pray that I'll be helpful to you. Pray that God will open up my mouth. And he'll humble me. Now, church, just pray for yourself. Pray that God will remove distractions. And he'll open up your ears so that you may respond in faith. Our Father, we come before you. We ask you to do a mighty work. We pray this in your son's holy and righteous name. Amen. So I want to read our text this morning, and then I want to give some thoughts on how we understand our text, how we apply our text to today. Colossians 3, starting in verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ, for the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Masters, treat your bondservants just and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. First thing, and most obvious, I think we need to talk about this morning is if you all are having gospel conversations throughout the week, you have heard this question. Doesn't the Bible support slavery? And not only support it, but encourage slavery. And this is one of the texts people will often go to. Colossians 3, Ephesians chapter 5. They'll say, see, Paul didn't come out and say, hey, let's end slavery so clearly the Bible supports slavery. And so I want to answer this question. I want, to, I want us to understand how we answer this apologetic in our world. First and foremost, let's think about it historically and then we'll work to biblically. I want to remind people that it was a church, the people of God, who fought hardest against slavery. I think most notably of William Wilberforce, who was in Great Britain, saved by the Lord understood people to be in the image of God and went on a whole campaign, made it his life's mission to end slavery in Great Britain. And it was ended three days after he died. I think of 
the American evangelist, John Wesley, who wrote a letter encouraging William Wilberforce. I want you to listen to John Wesley, one of the greatest preachers in the history of the church, say this, quote, Go on in the name of God and in the power of his might till even American slavery, the vilest that ever saw the sun, shall vanish away before it. Those words were written to William Wilberforce in 1791. 72 years later, Abraham Lincoln would sign the Emancipation Proclamation Act in this country. The people of God have always been on the front line standing against evil. So how do we understand Paul putting this text in front of people? Why didn't Paul just say, all right, slave owners, here's what you're going to do. Free all the slaves. Let them go. Why didn't Paul say that? First, I think we must understand the context of the slavery that they're talking about versus the context of the slavery in this country. Two very radically different slaveries. Uh, during this time, uh, slavery was used as a way to pay off debt. Somebody would come, they need money from a wealthy landowner, and it would be a large sum of money, and the person would have to sell themselves, possibly their family, into the work of that landowner and would stay on their land because, again, they didn't have money to buy property, and so they would work themselves, and that's how they would provide for them and their family. How do we know this? Because Paul is connecting all this. He does the same thing in Ephesians 5 as he does Colossians 3. He starts husband, wife, then he goes uh, parent, child, and now he goes slave, master. So you see this stair step has no kind of, there's no way to distinguish these things. All this was the life of those who lived in. But I also want you to pay attention that the Bible speaks horrifically, excuse me, the Bible speaks very clearly against the slavery that happened in America. And unfortunately, when people don't know their Bibles, you get the disaster of people who said they're Christians and then doing these things. Let me give an example. First Timothy 1.10, Paul brings a charge against the ungodly and the sinners. And in that list, he says, enslavers. Man stealing is condemned. Exodus 21, 16. He who kidnaps, steals a man or woman shall be put to death. Deuteronomy 24, verse 7 says the same thing. Paul in 1 Corinthians says that if a slave can gain their freedom, if they can get to the point where they pay off all of their debt, let them do it and do it and go and be free. So Paul encourages that kind of freedom. So again, the question, why didn't Paul say, let them go? And the answer is simple. Rome said slaves are treated as property. Here and earlier in Colossians, when he talks that there's no distinction between slave or free, he's reminding slave owners, he's reminding slaves that slaves are not property, but they're people made in the image of God. And so he calls the masters, what? Treat them justly and fairly, which means what? That these, type, these slaves right here are not being kidnapped and sold in that kind of area. It was a willful covenant between masters and slave owners. So we don't have that kind of deal in our culture. So how do we understand this text? We just kind of throw it out and it doesn't apply to us. And I would say, no, I think, there's a, I think there's a principle we can pull from these texts on what it means if you are a, if you are a boss or, and or if you are a worker in your job. And I think God has a lot to say about how we are to work and how we're to think about work. And so uh, I'm gonna, we're going to use slave and kind of worker and then boss and owner kind of interchangeably. So just so you know, that's going to be where we're going to go. Um, I don't know which one's going to come out, but whatever comes out, you'll be able to kind of decode from there. It's pretty self-explanatory. So here we go. Verse 22. Bond servants, obey in everything those who are your earthly masters, not by way of eye service as people pleasers, but with sincerity of heart, fearing the Lord. First is a call to those who have submitted themselves to the authority of others, in this case of work. Uh, many people hate bosses. They hate being told what to do. And they'll finally say something like, well, I hate being told what to do, so I'm going to go start my own kind of gig. And so a word of caution to those types of people. Um, if you cannot follow, you cannot lead. The best leaders are those who know how to follow. And so here he reminds us that every single Christian, as we've talked about over the past few weeks, every single Christian is under authority. 
is, un, is submitting themselves under the authority. Because the problem why a lot of people don't like being told what to do by bosses is because they struggle with submission and they think, I know best. Submission is necessary for the Christian. Submission to authority is rare in our culture. The idol of our culture, the message of our culture is that you are perfect, you are good, The highest and most important thing you can do is love yourself. Your heart, your feelings are always right. They can never be trusted. Nothing is more important than your happiness. That's the message of our culture. You and you alone. You're awesome. You're great. No one can tell you otherwise. And man, when you hear a pastor come at you and say, hey, you're a filthy, rotten sinner, man, that doesn't sit well with us. Why? Because we love to be on the throne of our own lives, don't we? And here is the gospel, that you and I are born wicked, enemy is God. We've worshiped the creation over the creator, and God sent his son into the world, crushed him on that cross, so that you and I will be free to say no to self and yes to God. And, and here's the glorious fact. Here's the glorious fact. What the gospel will ultimately do is it's gonna, there's going to be some hard points in the gospel, but what the gospel will produce is unending, never stopping, never ceasing joy in your lives. The mentality of our culture that you can never be questioned, that you can never ever, that your happiness is the most highest important part of your life must be nailed to the cross at Calvary. And so when the gospel comes into our hearts, we realize that this was the message of Christ. This was the whole idea of Christ who what? He said, I'm not worried about my happiness now. I'm seeking the joy that is set before me, the joy that is found in me, giving into my life unto the cross, trusting that the Father will do something magnificent. And this is the joy. This is why Christ came. I am here to do the will of my Father. Oh, that that would be our mindset. I'm here to do what he has called me to. And so here in Colossians chapter 3, he says, bond servants obey in everything those who are your masters. So when it says everything, we must understand that there's a bookends to Colossians 3.22. You have be obedient, submit yourself into everything, but how does the end of that verse end? In fear of God the Lord. Which means what? Just as wives submit to their husbands as unto the Lord, so do bond servants submit to their masters unto the Lord. Which means what? Just like wives don't have to submit when their husbands to call them to something sinful, so then bond servants don't have to submit when their masters call them to something sinful. So what is the guiding principle? The fear of the Lord. And so I want to talk about the fear of the Lord for just a few moments because this is the truth. Um, Someone over you, someone in authority over you might call you to something difficult, something inconveniencing, something hard. And what is the joy of the Christian? As long as it's not sin, work heartily unto the Lord. And so how does the fear of the Lord play into this? There's the age-old question, would you rather be feared or loved? And to quote the great philosopher Michael Scott, easy both. I want people to be afraid of how much they love me. So that, that's kind of how we all, and so look, if you don't know that reference, Michael Scott, The Office, go watch it. It's great. Um, look, if that's, if that's, that's kind of how we think God is, that God's up there and saying, I want them to be afraid of how much they love me. And I'm here to tell you, that's not what fear of the Lord is. Some people have tried to say, well, we don't really worry about the fear of the Lord anymore. That's more Old Testament. The New Testament doesn't have anything to say against that. After all, 1 John says, perfect love casts out fear. And I would say what? Well, let's take a look at what the scriptures say. Plenty of commands in the New Testament has to do with fear of the Lord in the New Testament. Acts 9, 31, living in the fear of the Lord. Luke 23, the insurrectionist says to the other insurrectionist, don't you fear God Paul, 2 Corinthians chapter 7, bringing holiness to completion. How? In the fear of the Lord. 1 Peter chapter 2, honor everyone, love the brotherhood, fear God, honor the emperor. And I think the most telling and most important, beautiful verse that helps us understand what is the fear of the Lord is found in 1 Peter 1.17. And if you call on him as father, 
who judges impartially according to each one's deed, conduct yourselves with fear through the time of the exile. So here's what the fear of the Lord does. Here's how it kind of guides the Christian in their lives is if you call God Father, he's also what? Judge. And so what the Christian does is they do not look at their father behind that judgment seat and say, because the judge is also my father, I can do whatever I want and it'll be okay. No, we look at that and we say, because my father is a judge, I want to love and serve him in everything. And I'm afraid, I'm terrified of ever offending my father. This plays out like practically for you in your, in your own lives. And you know this. Because look, in my house, the thing that I'm afraid most of is making my wife cry. Man, I, I don't want to do that, bro. Like, so, and I, I come into my house, and that doesn't mean I walk on eggshells in my house, but what? It stops me, it emboldens me, it empowers me to do everything in my power to ensure I'm not the one that makes her cry. And so the fear of the Lord is we are terrified to be the one to offend the holy God. That's the fear of the Lord. And so that causes us to what? Love God more than we love the applause of man. And so here, Christian, beloved, how do we understand the fear of the Lord? We're more afraid to offend God. And that ignites us and fuels us into loving and serving Him. And so how does this work in our own works, in our own jobs? How does this work? And the question is this, at your job, are you doing everything in your power to glorify God? Do you see other people made in the image of God? Do you go the extra mile even when no one is watching? Do you do the extra work even when it doesn't get you more money, more accolades, Do you work harder because Christ has done all the work on your behalf? Do you go into your job thinking, I want them to hire people who are just like me in this job. And I'm going to work unto that end. If your work is done just to curry favor from the bosses, just to be seen as a goo dooter, it's not from the Lord. It's not from your heart. Think of it this way. That's not how we treat our Christian walk, right? We don't come in here on Sunday, put on the holy face, put on the holy costume, all fine and dandy, smiles and everything, and then live like a scoundrel Monday through Saturday. That's not the life of the Christian. We don't care about eye service. We care about true gospel-centered, heart-changing, God-glorifying work. And this is what is getting at here. And so the Christian doesn't come in and go, okay, God, I've dragged my tail into here. I've put my bucks in the plate. Now, God, you owe me for the rest of the week. That's not the gospel. The gospel is what? I give everything so that you may be glorified. I come into this place. Why? So that I may meet with God, so I may experience God, so I may hear God's word, be transformed, so I may be ignited to live my life Monday through Saturday, so I may give heartily, not for some sort of eye obedience, not so some people can look at me and say, look at him, he's so faithful, so that we may get the applause of God, not the applause of man. So what? In your job, it doesn't matter who's watching you or who's not watching you. Your job, you work the same when people are watching, when people are not watching. Your obedience, therefore, your obedience does not lead to a heart change. Your heart change leads to obedience. We even treat the Word of God this way, don't we? Uh, We don't go to the Word of God and go, okay, God, I'm going to read your Word, and because I read your Word, you therefore owe me. God's Word is so much greater than that. Some people will talk about God's Word simply like this. God's Word has all the answers we need to in life. And look, that's a fine view. I, I don't have a problem with that view. It's just way too small. It's way too small. God's word is the self-revelation of who God is. And sure, it's got answers for you in life, but what is, what is God's word ultimately designed to do? To ignite you, to fuel you into worship. Uh, we read this this past week um, 
in Exodus. Y'all remember they go, they collect the manna. God says, I'll collect it for one day. Some knuckleheads tried to be smarter than God and collect it for the next day. And what did it say? There was bugs and maggots in their manna, right, the next morning. And someone brilliantly in my home group this week just said it this way. Um, and this wasn't me, so don't think that I'm like playing coy. This is someone else because I wouldn't have this much intelligence. Um, they said, look, just like God's word, we don't use our quiet time from yesterday to give us today's bread. It's his bread each and every day that is needed. And so, beloved, in the same way, we don't go to God's word just so we can um, be holy, just to look for answers to everyday questions. No, we go to God's word that we may meet with God, that we may be transformed, that we may be ignited into the awe of God. Verse 23 through 25. Whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord, not for men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the inheritance as your reward. You are serving the Lord Christ. For the wrongdoer will be paid back for the wrong he has done, and there is no partiality. Um, The motivating factor is that you are not working for mean, nasty, terrible bosses, although they may be, but you're working unto the Lord. Some of you might be in a position in your jobs where you're like, if I work hard, then my boss will be successful. My boss is successful. He'll get the accolades. And so you'll try to kind of like weasel your way out of that and put good Christianese on it. Well, I don't want the wicked to be in charge here, so I'm just not going to work hard. I'm going to help God out. Um, That's not how the work is done. How do I know that? Because we look to the cross. In everything, the Christian looks up to the cross. Do you remember Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane? Look, 500 dudes show up to arrest one man. Like, that's an army showing up to arrest one guy, right? And they come and they say, where is Jesus of Nazareth? And John says, Jesus stepped forward and said, here I am. And they all fell backwards, 500. Look, if I was in the army right there, I'm like, I'm out. Dude, the dude with his word just knocked me on my tail. I'm done. Y'all go have fun. And you remember Peter? He like breaks out his little sword. I got you, Jesus, right? And how like it just was crazy that he would even do that. And what did Jesus say? Hey, put your swords away. I don't need you to defend me. Here I am. Let's go. You see, Jesus handed himself over to those who were lawless and wicked. Why? Because he trusted in the plan of the Father. And so in our jobs, we don't use this whole kind of idea that if we were to work hard for someone, that God's not going to use that for his glory. He says what? You worry about you. Let me worry about your bosses. In the same way with husbands and wives, right? We said there's no if-then statements with husbands and wives, right? There is no if-then statements with bond servants and masters. It says what? You work as though your boss is Christ. That's how seriously God takes this. And so what do we work for? We work for joy. In 1 John, John wrote it this way, His commands are not burdensome. So when we see the commands of God, we do not look at the commands of God and go, that's so burdensome on me. You're ruining my groove, bro. But no, we say what? All to the glory of God. So when someone at our job asks us to do something, even if it is outside the purview of what we've been hired to do, it's not burdensome. And we go with joy. We say, wherever you lead, God, I will follow. Why? Because I love you and I love your commands. Psalm 1830. As for God, his way is perfect. The Lord's word is flawless. He shields all who take refuge in him. So your attitude when a superior asks you to do something reflects the glory and the majesty of God. Next, he says, work heartily. He says, work with all of your heart unto the Lord. I think it's one of the saddest things that people separate their walk with Christ from their job they've been called to. It always intrigued me that it was Jesus who said, those who are faithful in little are faithful in much. Whoever is dishonest in very little is dishonest in much. I want us to think about some of the greatest heroes of the faith. Moses, y'all remember, grew up, right? Messed up, exiled, right? And for 40 years, what was his Spotify playlist? Bah. And look, that's a long, 
grueling, smelly, nasty job of shepherding. Why? Because God used that little job, that grueling, difficult, unappreciative job to make, to prepare him to be a shepherd for his people. Same thing happens, right? You got Peter. He's a fisherman. Fisherman back then. I know fishing we do for fun here, but that was hard work, man. These guys had, they're ripped with muscles. You want a good workout? Do the fishing they did back then. They'd throw their nets over and then bring it up, throw their nets over and bring it up. That's long, arduous, difficult work. And Jesus comes to Peter and he says, what? I will make you fishers of men. So what? What that means is some of you are in your jobs right now and you're seeing it is mundane and you're looking to the end. Can't wait. It's getting boring. It's getting old. Look, I I get it. When I was a server, right? 500th table. Hi, my name is Scott. I'll be taking care of you and you got to hold that smile like this, right? I I I get that. But every job at some point has some mundaneness to it. Even heart surgeons, I bet you after their thousandth heart they've worked on, they come home and they say, well, honey, did what I always do, fixed another heart. But you see, every, since every job has a mundane, mund, mundaneness to it, we mean what? That we look not to what our job does, but we, we've been called to in our own job. I think, of, I think of moms as they have those little scoundrels at their own house. And how when their husband comes home and says, yep, fix my thousandth heart for the day. She said, well, at least you got to get out. I was stuck in here and all this, but what, but, but theologically we know what? That they are called to something great. And so there's this like weird discussion in the house where it's like, well, you're called to something great. And we always need to be reminded you're working unto the Lord. That everything you do is for the Lord. Lord. And so we must realize that our jobs, although they may feel mundane, are not themselves mundane. They're the glorious calling of God so that he may be known in all areas of the world. And so Paul says what? Because there is an inheritance that awaits us. We don't think of heaven just as a future place, but a present reality. That if you have been bought and paid for by the blood of the Lamb, the Holy Spirit indwells within you, you have heaven right amidst you now. And so in your job, you are walking in the glorious riches of heaven, the glorious riches of God himself at Christ's expense, calling you that although you're walking through the mundaneness of being a shepherd or a fisherman or whatever you're doing, God is the one that is getting the glory through your joy in even the most mundane of things because God continues to prepare you for the ministry in which you've been called to. So what happens when it gets hard and tiring and exhausting? One of my favorite texts is this in Romans chapter 8. Who can bring a charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? It is Christ Jesus who is condemned on our behalf. So the motivation in our most difficult times is my job doesn't condemn me. No person condemns me. If Christ has justified me, I walk in newness of life and I seek my applause from him, not as a license to do whatever I want, but as a license to run to him in all things. Finally, Christian, know this when it comes to slaves. The greatest term you can be called as a Christian is a slave. Paul, right? I mean, the brother, again, 60% of the New Testament, right? Not only was he right, 60% of the New Testament, man, he walked into cities and it turned cities on their head. His favorite thing that he was called for himself was what? That of a slave. I'm a bond servant. I'm a slave to Christ. And that was his mentality through his whole ministry. And so he gets to Ephesus. Man, that's a neat deal to be at Ephesus. I mean, they were the best, most theologically sound church on the corner. And he says, I got to go. And they said, if you go, you will die. And he says, what? To live is Christ, to die is gains away seven Philippians. But what? He said, I am here because I am under orders. I'm under the authority of God. Because Paul did not see his life as his own, but a life that was bought by his master, Jesus of Nazareth. Do you see your lives 
as though you're a slave unto Christ. Chapter 4, verse 1. Masters, treat your bondservants justly and fairly, knowing that you also have a master in heaven. Finally, a note to master those who are in authority, those who are bosses. There's a set of instructions for you that God has given you. First, remember that you are not the highest authority. Don't think so highly of yourself that you think you are the bee's knees because you have some under an authority under you. That is a dangerous place. It amazes me how the business world has finally caught on. We have this revolutionary idea called servant leadership. Where have they been, right? It's the best leadership in the world. Yes, it's a cat's meow. Why? Because Christ modeled that first. First, if you're a boss, you must see those under you not as numbers, not as production, but as people made in the image of God. Remember, servant leadership is how Christ leads his church. It's amazing all the military strategies in the world, yet the gospel, Christ giving of himself, dying, and the gospel is still conquering nations, conquering hearts still to this day. So how do you see somebody as a person rather than a number or something to fulfill your production vision as the king master of your business? Very simply. One of your employees having a rough quarter, man. Their sales are down or whatever. Their production level is down. Here's what a boss does. A boss walks in and says, this is what your productivity is. If you don't fix it this next quarter, you're gone. That's what a boss does. Well, how much does that brother want to go work for you now? You know what a leader does? A leader walks in and says, hey, look, what's going on in your life? Why don't you and I sit and talk? How are things going at home? How are things going with you? Tell me about your life. And I guarantee you in that, they're going to tell you something like, man, it's been rough. All this has happened. Now you've just changed. Now you've become a leader who cares about their soul and cares about their hearts. And what are they going to want to do? They're going to want to work for you. You didn't threaten them. You've allowed them to be seen as a person. That's what it means to be treated justly and fairly. Remember, leader, you are responsible for those under you. So then, if you're leader, you usually have leaders above you. Someone under you does something wrong. Your first reaction as a leader in your business is not to get, just throw them under the bus. Well, this knucklehead Scott, he can't get anything right, so let's kick him to the curb. No, you must remember, leader, that you are responsible for those under you, which means what? You take primary responsibility when someone under you does something wrong. That's what Jesus did. He didn't sin, but what did he do? I'll pay for it. And you might say, bro, that's going to cost me a lot in my job. I'm going to say that's the whole point of the gospel, that it costs you a lot. But God is glorified in that. Do you know why? Because when those under you see you leading that way, what do they see? They see the man, the God-man Jesus who came down. You sinned. He took the price so that you could be set free. He said, I'll take their sins on my back so that they may be free. Beloved, the gospel infuses in every part of our lives. So we've gathered, we've grown, we how therefore do we go? First, we as a people of God have been called to work and to work hard. Remember, our rest is found not in our bed, but in, our, but in the Lord. Therefore, we work hard for the glory and the majesty of God. Don't give me this whole thing where like, I got to take some time off so I can take my Bible, you know what I mean, and go and get in my room and quiet. Hey, look, the question is, are you doing that in your free time? That's the better question. Are you using your free time to seek the Lord? Because you've been called to work hard. One of my favorites is the Proverbs 31 woman. How she works hard at home raising the kids. And then what? She's got a side hustle. Why? For the glory of God. Your work and your walk go hand in hand. They're not at odds with one another. The call is straightforward. Work unto the Lord. Next, there's a grave warning to those that see work as an idol. 
You know your work's an idol when you use work to hide from the, what you've truly been called to, family, church, friends, etc. And that doesn't mean friends hanging out kind of a thing, by the way. That means serving and loving those. So, if you're using your work to hide from your family, your work's an idol. You've been called to a family. You've been called to make disciples. That starts in the job place. And your job should not be a place that anesthetizes you from the rest of the world. So why then Sunday morning? So we can come in and we can worship and we could hear about the glorious riches of Christ so that you may fulfill the call to make disciples in your job. And so how hard do you work at your job? As hard as it takes that people to see the glory and the majesty of God. Finally, one of the best questions we can all ask is this. How am I living out the gospel in my life? Since the gospel changes everything, where is the gospel most clearly seen in my life? This is why I think it's vital that you and I carefully think about the glorious riches of cross and Calvary. Do you see your Christian life as being a slave unto the Lord? Do you see your leadership leading as Christ leads you? How he's empowered you? How he's led his disciples? Not by being served, but by serving? Do you trust God enough to give up of your free time when a coworker calls you and says, I need you to cover my shift? Do you trust God enough to say, fine, I'll give up my free time to serve someone else? And they'll say, why did you do that for me? Why do you always say yes? Because let me tell you about someone who covered my shift that couldn't be covered by my own expense. That's the gospel. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you for this text. We thank you, God, that you've called us to work unto you and a great grand calling it is to work unto you. So Father God, we ask for help. God, that you would ignite us, that you would fuel us, that the gospel would be clearly seen, not only in word, but in deed and in, tr- in action. God, in our workplace. God, may we remember that our work comes not f- our, our work comes from you and our rest is not from our bed but from you as well. God may we live to this end. We pray this in your son's holy and righteous name. Amen.